I felt that I had to defend myself. But the prosecutor doesn't buy it. She had conspired with other people to try to kill her father. I wasn't lying. I was telling the truth. Her punishment? Life in prison. It's a severe sentence, and she deserves every bit of it. Yet some feel the case calls for leniency. I think the governor's going to feel that way, too. In 1990, St. Louis teenager Stacy Leonard confessed to shooting and killing her father as he slept on their living room couch. In her confession, Leonard told police she had pulled the trigger to put an end to years of sexual abuse. But the state maintained she had killed in cold blood, and a jury agreed. After more than a decade in prison, Stacy Leonard is mounting a campaign for clemency. It's only now, she claims, that she can fully explain what drove her to murder. <laughs> July 3rd, 1990. With the Gateway Arch as a majestic backdrop, St. Louis, Missouri celebrated America's independence. That same night, 18-year-old Stacy Leonard claimed her own independence in brutal fashion by killing her father in their home as he slept on the couch. Now, years later, Stacy Leonard is in the Women's Correctional Center in Vandalia, Missouri. It's hard. It's hard to wake up in this place every day. She's serving a sentence of life without parole, her only hope an act of clemency from the governor. But prosecutors say if anyone does not deserve mercy, it's Stacy Leonard. They say she murdered for money, half a million dollars to be exact, and call her story a flat out lie. It makes it pretty clear to me um, that she's manufacturing, she's making up the, the whole allegation of sexual abuse. I didn't want anybody to think that I had killed my dad for money. Leonard says her father's murder was an act of desperation, born out of years of abuse. But the story she tells now is different than the one she told then. It's more horrific, the details more sickening. Some memories Leonard claims have returned in the years since her conviction. It's only with the passage of time that she says she can bring herself to talk about them. And she does, in graphic detail. He asked me to kiss his friend, like big girls do. I didn't like... the... I called it the white stuff. And he told me that that was marshmallow cream. He had placed some marshmallow cream on him and asked me to lick it off. And I did. Her attorney says it makes perfect sense that the shocking details are just now coming out. She's so typical of abused children. It's taken years. It's taken years before she can say the words that she's needed to say to explain this horrible thing that happened to her. 1990, the 4th of July. At 4.20 p.m., police responded to a call at 3719 Eminence Street in the middle-class St. Louis suburb of St. John, the home of 18-year-old Stacy Leonard. When officers arrived at the house, they found Stacy and a friend, Jason Fortune. The teenagers said they had called police after looking into the home and seeing the bloodied body of Stacy's father on the couch. They had not gone into the house. They uh, saw the uh, in individual who was the victim lying on a couch from a what we'd call a peephole uh, in a front door. The victim, 43-year-old Tom Leonard, a divorced father who worked as a financial advisor and lived with his two teenage daughters. He had been shot once in the shoulder and again, point blank in the forehead. A short time later, Stacy's younger sister, Christy, arrived at the Leonard house. She ran up to her sister and the two became hysterical. As the girls cried, 
the police realized there was a problem with Stacy and her friend's story. What they said that they saw could not be seen from that little peephole in, in the front door with the distance between that and where Mr. Lannert was lying on a couch dead. They could not have seen what they said unless they were in the room with the victim. The chief told officers he had his suspicions. They said to take them down to the station and separate them because this is one of those three did it. Police drove Stacy Leonard, her sister Christy, and their friend Jason Fortune back to the station where the three gave written statements. In evaluating the written statements, there were some major discrepancies in what each one of them said. St. Louis County Detective Tom Schulte has worked extensively with juveniles during his career. He was brought in to question Stacy Leonard later that evening. When I walked into the room, I just had that feeling that there wasn't something right. I thought that she was uh, keeping something from me about the family life. The detective, who specialized in child abuse cases, raised the subject of abuse with Stacy. I go, was there any type of abuse, either physical or sexual, in the family? You know, was there anything going on at the house? And Schulte said, did your dad ever hit you? And I looked at him and I said, no. And I started crying. And I knew that he knew that my dad had abused me. She told me that over the years, uh, she had been abused and raped by her father. Then Stacy dropped a bombshell. And that's when she confessed to killing her father. I told him that yes, it was me, and um, that I had done it. The detective wanted to know more about the alleged abuse. I had her tell me some specific things, like about when it started, uh, how she felt when it first started, uh, the things that I had known from experience is usually true, you know, uh, the feelings, uh, uh, how you feel trapped. And she came across with, with what I was looking for. So as she told me her story from the beginning, you know, there was no reason for me to uh, not to believe her. The detective then asked Leonard to describe the murder. She told me that's when she uh, shot him once. The first shot, I believe, hit him in the collarbone in the back. He sat up. Uh, mumbled a few words about, you know, give me some help, call 911, and then laid his head back down, and that's when she shot him again. Following her confession, the police took Stacy back to the house to do a video walkthrough of the crime scene. Stacy says she felt like she was in shock. I didn't even remember half of what had already happened, and I was so just emotionless by this time. I just couldn't... Oh, God, I couldn't believe that all this had happened and that in my life, whew, it was just too overwhelming. You understand your rights and you're willing to do this of your own free will in the court. Okay, now, would you first take me back to how, to the window where you got into the, the uh, building at? Stacy told police she and her sister had been out past curfew. They entered the house through a window so they wouldn't wake up their father. She said her only reason for returning to the house was to pick up a puppy they had recently adopted. Well, what happened when you came back last night? I um, came through the window. I came in, I got my dog. And then the gun was... It was... hanging up against this chair right here. And I decided at that moment that... I was going to do it. I was going to kill him. Was the gun already loaded? Yes. What did you do next after you decided that you were going to do it last night? Went upstairs. Went upstairs? Okay, show me the ride you took. Put the gun on the little ledge and then pulled the trigger. Okay. The first the first time you shot him, where did you hit him? Right here in the shoulder. In the left shoulder? Yes. Okay, what did he do? He woke up. He thought that he had broke his collarbone. And uh, he started calling my name. Stacy said she wanted to call 911, but wasn't able to find the phone. I couldn't find it. And I panicked. So then I shot him again. 
After making the video, Detective Schulte said he believed Stacy was telling the truth and felt sorry for her. So he made her a promise. I just told her I'd always be there, you know, when it came for trial, and that she could count on me testifying. Detective Schulte was unaware of what Stacy's sister and friend Jason were telling police. If what they said was true, it would appear Stacy had a more sinister motive for killing her father. I really believe it was more for financial gain than for out of the pure hatred of the man. On the 4th of July, 1990, 18-year-old Stacy Leonard was sitting in a St. Louis jail cell. Hours earlier, she had confessed to police that she shot and killed her father, Tom Leonard, the day before. I closed my eyes and I pulled the trigger. She claimed that years of sexual abuse had driven her to murder. I was very, very just broken and defeated. One of the investigating officers, a specialist in abuse cases, found Stacy's story convincing. I believe that she was raped by her father prior to the homicide. It was more of a, a revenge murder for the years of abuse. But in the days after the murder, the chief of police would reach a far different conclusion. It's my belief that uh, that was a, a, a ploy uh, if not a bold-faced lie in which to try to justify why the act was committed. The motive, the chief would conclude, was money. From the outset, Chief Milam could find no one to back up Stacy's claim of abuse. I believe she did say uh, something to Detective Schulte about being abused, but that was never confirmed. The only one to mention any abuse was Stacy's sister, Christy, who said the first time she ever heard of it was after her father's murder. In a written police statement, Christy said, quote, Dad and I had a basically normal relationship. He never made any sexual advances towards me or to Stacy, to my knowledge. After it happened, though, Stacy told me he had raped her. Christy also said after the murder, she was coached by Stacy and her friend, Jason Fortune, telling police, quote, they told me to say that we went back to our house to get the puppy and not to say anything about all the money she spent. Money. Several of Stacy's friends brought up the subject with police. Stacy, it seems, had been telling her friends that her father recently inherited a large amount of money, $500,000, money she stood to gain if he died. I'd found a slip for certificate of deposit that was cashed once that was $100,000. And I said, wow, you know, I didn't realize we had that much money. So they tried to say that I wanted that money. She had her car picked out. She had Christy's car picked out. She even had my car picked out. Uh, she wanted to open a nightclub. Um, she wanted to have all kinds of real neat paintings and stuff, you know. Stacy's friend, Jason Fortune, faced with the possibility of being charged as an accessory, told police Stacy had been forging her father's signature on checks and had recently bought herself a $600 car stereo with her father's credit card. Stacy and her dad did not get along at all, but I really believe it was more for financial gain than for out of the pure hatred of the man. So Stacy mentioned to you several times during this period before he was killed, that she would she would have tremendous financial gain. Yes. The teenager claimed to have witnessed Stacy getting cash together to pay off a hitman to kill her father. Okay, and why did she say she was cashing the check? The specific reason? To give to Ronnie so that he would be paid off to kill her father. Ronnie was Ron Barnett, a former babysitter of Stacy Leonard. The next day, he was brought to the station for questioning and quickly confirmed the story about hiring a hitman. It all started um, about four weeks ago uh, with her just telling me that she wanted to kill her father. And uh, eventually it led to her asking me if I knew anybody that would kill him. 
Melanie Brown, one of Christy Leonard's friends, told police that she heard about the murder plot from Christy just days before it happened. She just said that, she's like, yeah, me and Stacy are gonna have our dad killed or something like that. Ever since then, Stacy's been spending money like it grows on trees. Police learned that despite all the talk of hiring a hitman, just a week before the murder, Stacy and her sister had practiced firing their father's gun in an open field. Who fired the weapon? Stacy and Christy. Both of them fired. Yes. Then police learned from Stacy's friends that just days before he was murdered, Tom Leonard found out about Stacy's spending spree. My dad got mad a few days ago because of he found out that Stacy had wrote checks and signed his name. Stacy's actions after the killing did not add to her credibility. Her friend Ron told investigators about how Stacy showed up at his house early the next morning after the murder. She told me that uh, she had killed her father, and uh, I didn't I didn't know what to think. You know, she had a gun in the car and asked me if I would get rid of it. Today, Christy Leonard admits that she was willing to tell police whatever she needed to help her sister, whom she insists is the victim. I told him so many different things. I don't remember. I don't know. I just didn't want to tell him the truth, you know. She didn't want anybody to know the real reason, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. But at the time she shot him, it wasn't for monetary gain. But after wading through all the statements and inconsistencies, the chief of police who oversaw the investigation could only reach one conclusion. That just before the murder, Stacy Leonard was acting more like a mastermind than a victim. I firmly believe from reading the, the various statements that she had made prior to the, uh, the homicide that uh, it, it was for material gain, uh, monetary gain only. In late July, Stacy Leonard was charged with first-degree murder. The question now was whether Leonard's lawyer could build a defense around her allegations of abuse. I was going to do it. I was in St. Louis on July 30th, 1990. 18-year-old Stacy Leonard was indicted for the murder of her father, 43-year-old financial consultant Tom Leonard. In confessing the murder, Stacy said she was driven to kill after being sexually abused by her father for years. But prosecutor Bob McCullough says this was no case of self-defense. Once we got into it, it, it was pretty clear that it was, uh, without question, a murder first degree case. It's the difference between a cold-blooded murder and a hot-blooded murder, and this is a cold-blooded murder. Leonard's motive, McCullough says, was pure and simple to get her hands on a $500,000 inheritance. Stacy's younger sister, Christy, was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. If convicted, the sisters faced maximum sentences of life in prison. Their friend, Jason Fortune, was not charged and agreed to testify for the prosecution. Leonard's defense attorney, Chris McGraw, knew it would be an uphill battle to win in court. What we had was a victim who was asleep at the time of the first shot, and then a second uh, kill shot. To prove his client's claim that she was motivated by years of abuse, McGraw would have to dig into Leonard's psychological background and family history. In the summer of 1969, Stacy's mother, Deborah Underwood, met 23-year-old Tom Leonard. He was very charming, and he was sophisticated. And just a very, he was very gentlemanly like and always treated me well. I thought he was my knight in shining armor at the time. They were married in the fall of 1970, and Deb was eager to start a family. Actually, he wanted me to go on to college, and I told him I wanted to have a baby. So, so I got pregnant and, and had Stacy. Stacy was born in May 1972. Her sister Christy came along two years later. Deb stayed home with the children while Tom Leonard went to work as an insurance actuary. Deb says at first her husband was a good provider and a good father, as Stacy also recalls. I had a great childhood. Um, 
my mom was real focused on her kids, me and my sister, and we were very loved, felt extremely loved. Everything was perfect, as perfect as it can be. But as the girls grew older, Tom's work became unsteady. By the time Stacy was in grade school, she says, things at home were starting to change. My dad wound up transferring around a lot, going to different jobs. Um, and eventually he started drinking. Tom's drinking grew worse after his own father passed away in 1980. Stacy says that's when the abuse began. She was eight years old. At first I didn't really realize that it was wrong. It was just a game. It was our game. And he had me sit on his lap and eventually he had me touch him. Stacy said he only played the game when he'd been drinking. He told me that I was his favorite daughter and that it was our secret and that it's a game that only him and I would play. But about a year later, according to Stacy, the game turned violent. I was nine the first time that my dad ever raped me. And when he raped me, he hurt me. It, it hurt so badly, like I was just being torn into pieces. The next day, Stacy says, she suddenly viewed this man as a two-faced monster, not the loving father she'd always known. In no way did he resemble that same person that had hurt me the night before. He was just different, smiling, happy to see me. He acted like nothing had happened. Over the next nine years, Stacy says her dad would sometimes rape her as often as two to three times a week. She says this would occur while her mother was in the house. She'd be upstairs. And I really thought she knew, because in the beginning, I would scream to get away from him. I heard Stacy squeal down in the basement. And she would come to the top of the stairs and yell down and ask if everything was OK. And I'd say, what's going on? And he'd say, nothing. We were just playing. And Stacy would say, yeah, that's what we were doing. And so I'd go back upstairs. She'd turn around and walk away. And he'd rape me. So I did think she knew. But Underwood says although she felt uneasy about what she heard coming from the basement, she let it go. Stacy appeared to grow into a typical teenager. She played volleyball. She was a cheerleader. She had friends. I was involved in as many school activities as I could be. I loved going to school because there I could pretend like everything was OK. Stacy's mother, Deb Underwood, says in time, her relationship with her husband grew tense because of his drinking. By 1985, the couple divorced, agreeing to joint custody of their daughters, 13-year-old Stacy and 11-year-old Christy. After the divorce, Stacy's anger and resentment toward her mother emerged. I wouldn't talk to her anymore. She'd tell me to do something, and I'd be very insolent towards her. Deb Underwood thought her daughter was angry over the divorce. She believed therapy might help and arranged counseling for Stacy. Stacy's demeanor in therapy led the counselor to suspect she may have been abused. She felt that Stacy had some symptoms of a of you know a person who had been molested or I don't even think she said raped at the time. I think I think she had said molested. Deb Underwood chose not to talk to Stacy about it, thinking her daughter wouldn't open up to her. Instead, Underwood confided in her mother, Stacy's grandmother, and asked if she would talk to Stacy. She did. And she asked Stacy, Has your father ever touched you in places he shouldn't? And Stacy said, Well, no, Grandma, my daddy wouldn't do anything like that. So I took it from that that she hadn't been molested, that Tom hadn't touched her inappropriately. I had separated my father into two separate people. One was the man who raped me, and the other was my daddy. You know, So if anybody was to ask me if my dad had hurt me, I could answer in all honesty, no, because he wasn't. In my mind, he wasn't. In 1988, Stacy and Christy chose to live with their father in St. Louis when their mother remarried. Deb Underwood moved to Guam with her new husband, who was serving in the Air Force. About a year later, when Stacy was 17, 
she put her differences with her mom aside and went for an extended visit to Guam. Back in St. Louis, her younger sister Christy began having trouble with her father. It got pretty horrible and be out drinking. And then when he came home, um, I'd get beat up a lot. After a few months, Christy asked her sister to come home. Afraid for her sister's safety, Stacy returned, and the sisters grew closer. Against their father's wishes, they got a dog. We kind of hid it from him at first, and then he found out, and he didn't like it. Threatened to kill it. Stacy claims that shortly after her return, the sexual abuse resumed. Dad was becoming increasingly violent, not just towards me, but also towards my sister. And he would threaten. He would threaten both of us. He was very controlling, and uh, I had to depend on him for cash. A month after returning home, Stacy began telling her friends she hated her father and wanted him dead. At first, Christy didn't take the threats seriously. I don't think it was something she'd actually do. It was just like a fantasy type deal. Because I thought about it, too, sometimes. It was really nice to fantasize about, to be able to close your eyes and imagine this man who terrorizes you and rapes you and beats your sister not being there anymore. Then came July 3rd, 1990. As the Independence Day celebrations got underway in St. Louis, tensions were rising at the Lanert House. We were arguing over the dog. He wanted me to get rid of it, and I said, I'm not getting rid of this dog. After the argument, Stacy and Christy went out for dinner with friends and paid for it with Tom Leonard's credit card. They went to the city's annual Independence Day celebration, which was always held near the Gateway Arch. They had fireworks. I don't really remember seeing them, but I'm sure we did. But I don't really remember. Um, and we came back and dropped her friends off. By this time, it was past curfew, and the girls say they didn't want to go back home and face their father's wrath. They planned on using his credit card to spend the night at a motel. But first, they wanted to pick up their dog. We didn't want to go through the front door because he was sleeping on the couch. So we went in through the basement window. I guess he woke up upstairs. I, I heard something upstairs and the gun was downstairs. So I took it up there. I just wanted it all to end and be over. And I set the gun on top of a ledge and I closed my eyes and I pulled the trigger. He was screaming my name. He didn't realize that he was shot. I was terrified, just absolutely terrified. I just remember Stacy telling me to call 911, and I remember frantically searching for her phone, and I couldn't find one. The girl said they later realized their father had ripped the phone lines out of the wall. He started calling us all kinds of names, calling us sluts and whores, and just wait till I get up from here, and it just, it was just too much, and I knew that if he ever got up from that couch, he would, he would kill us. He would kill us. I put that gun back on there and shot him a second time. Stacy then picked up the shell casing, put the gun in the car, and drove to a motel. The next morning, Stacy got rid of the gun with the help of her friend, Ron Barnett. I think she just, you know, snapped and shot him. I think to protect the both of us, you know, she didn't have enough. She was tired of his crap, basically. The more defense attorney Chris McGraw learned, the more convinced he grew that Stacy Leonard had been the victim of an abusive father. But would a jury believe his client's story? And even if it did, would it agree that such a horrific family history could somehow justify murder? In July 1990, St. Louis sisters Christy and Stacy Leonard were in custody for the murder of their father, Tom Leonard. Stacy faced a first-degree murder charge. Her younger sister, Christy, was accused of conspiracy to kill. 
even though Christie was only 16 years old. The judge ruled she could stand trial as an adult, a frightening prospect for the teenager. I was naturally scared, so um, I talked to Stacy, and Stacy, I guess, was scared for me too. And so we decided together, you know, this would probably be the best thing for me to take the plea bargain. On April 19, 1991, Christy Lannert accepted a deal offered by prosecutors pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit murder in exchange for a five-year sentence. Stacy Leonard faced a very different situation. An attempt at plea negotiations quickly broke down. The government stayed firm in its belief that Stacy murdered for money. The government kind of took a hard stand. that They found that the, the motive was uh, for pecuniary gain, and, um, and so we couldn't really reach a, a settlement. I guess part of me was arrogant and part of me was angry because I knew what I had went through and here these people were saying that I was lying and I wasn't lying, I was telling the truth. But due to Missouri law, Stacy could not plead self-defense. What we had was a victim who was asleep at the time of the first shot and then a second uh, kill shot. Missouri doesn't recognize that as a self-defense. In order to claim self-defense, the actor has to be in imminent danger of death or serious physical injury. Imminent means right now, right here, right now. So Stacy's attorney decided to go with an insanity defense. Once the jury heard what her mental state was, they could find her guilty, not of murder in the first degree, of murder in the second degree, meaning that she didn't premeditate. We felt that was the only way to get the past history of abuse was a mental health defense, uh, a uh, what they call NGRI, not, re not guilty by reasons of insanity. On October 26, 1992, the murder trial of Stacy Leonard got underway in St. Louis County. In its opening statement, the prosecution argued that Stacy had carefully planned and carried out the murder of her father. They told jurors she had practiced shooting with her father's gun with shells she had purchased. Prosecutors said Stacy Leonard fully intended to murder her father that night in July, 1990. She pretty much had it set up so that she could sneak back into the house through the basement window, sneak upstairs, knowing her father would, in all likelihood, be uh, asleep or passed out, uh, and then killed him. The prosecution started its case by playing the videotape walkthrough in which the defendant confessed to murdering her father. But her demeanor doesn't change from start to finish. She's very matter-of-fact about it. She'll uh, chew in her gum, kind of bored to be there. I mean, she, uh, you know, she could be just as easily describing what she had for dinner. And she's, you know, she's very uh, laid back about the whole process. Stacy came across in the courtroom as a very quiet, demure um, young woman. In that video, she looked so totally different. She looked like a, you know, very typical teenager. Um, so it was, it was a big contrast for what we saw in the courtroom. On the second day of the trial, Stacy's friend Jason Fortune took the stand. As he did in his taped confession, he told the court of Stacy's attempt to hire a hitman and pay for it with her father's money. In all the time that she, she's trying to hire somebody to kill her father. Uh, she certainly never mentions that, uh, that she is because he's been sexually abusing her. It's always because of the money. The prosecution argued that Stacy acted out of greed, that she killed her father to get her hands on a family inheritance. He inherited about a half million dollars. She was making plans for spending all of that money uh, once her father was dead. The prosecution offered proof of her spending sprees just before her father's death. From uh, about the middle of June, until the time she killed him, she spent about 5,000 of his dollars. She did it by forging his name on checks, checks that were made out to her. After two days of testimony, the state rested its case. On the third day of trial, the defense opened by calling Stacy Leonard. On the witness stand, Stacy offered very few details of the sexual abuse. I know that sounds really strange, but I figured everybody knew. I was so embarrassed and ashamed, and I know I was on trial for my life. I still couldn't say that he even raped me. I was just very ashamed. 
she looked scared to death and also like she was very nervous and hesitant about talking about any of the abuse that happened in her life. Another juror viewed Stacy quite differently. She did not present herself very well on the witness stand at all. Um, no remorse. Um, she appeared to look as if she was not telling the truth. Stacy Leonard's sister, Christy, was not called to testify on her sister's behalf. We interviewed her, and she would not admit to being sexually abused at the time. So we didn't think that Christy could really offer anything to us. In fact, may hurt us in the fact that she'd already pled guilty uh, to the offense. The defense called an expert in child sex abuse to testify to Stacy's state of mind at the time of the murder. The psychiatrist told the court that due to the sexual abuse Stacy had endured, she suffered from a dissociative disorder, a condition that caused her to disconnect with reality. Meaning that uh, at the time of the first and second shot, uh, she was not intent, she, it was not her intent, she was not premeditating, she did not coolly deliberate on killing her father. The insanity defense, I was not buying because Stacy shot him once, then went back and shot him again. She seemed to be a troubled teen, um, but insanity, no. The prosecution argued the abuse never even occurred. Uh, that's not to say that he was gonna win Father of the Year award, he certainly wasn't but there's absolutely no evidence and in fact evidence to the contrary of him uh, sexually or physically abusing either her or uh, her sister Christy. After five days of testimony, the fate of Stacy Leonard was put in the hands of the jury. Their verdict is next. St. Louis, Missouri. On October 30th, 1992, jurors began deliberating the fate of 20-year-old Stacy Leonard. Leonard had confessed to shooting and killing her father after what she claimed was years of sexual abuse. The charge, first-degree murder, carried a sentence of life behind bars. The lawyer had presented an insanity defense, hoping to convince jurors to consider a lesser charge. They had the option of either finding Stacy not guilty by reasons of mental illness, or they could also find that she did not deliberate and that she was guilty of the murder in the second degree. I mean, she admitted she killed him. It was whether it was first degree or second degree murder. The prosecution had argued the killing was carefully premeditated. The jury deliberated for only five and a half hours before reaching the verdict. On October 30th, 1992, Stacy Leonard was found guilty of the first degree murder of her father. She did take the gun. She bought shells for it. She took it out and practiced shooting. So people really felt that probably she did intend to kill him when she came back in the house that night. I feel like it was premeditated murder because she had tried to hire a hitman. I have sympathy for her if, if, if she was sexually molested. But that doesn't give her the right to just murder someone. Stacy says she was not surprised by the verdict. I knew that I had committed the crime, so I was, it still hurt to hear it. It still hurt to hear it that those 12 people would find you that way. Following the verdict, the judge handed down the mandatory sentence, life in prison without the possibility of parole. In this type of case, where someone that was victimized, as Stacy was, um, you really uh, hope to have a better outcome than that. It is, it's a severe sentence for anyone, and certainly for a 20-year-old. I'm not saying she doesn't deserve it. It's a severe sentence, and she deserves every bit of it. Stacy Leonard was sent to a maximum security prison in Vandalia, Missouri. In the years since her conviction, she has exhausted all her appeals. Her one last chance at freedom is an appeal to the governor of Missouri 
She hopes he'll grant her clemency. Stacy Leonard's attorney for more than a decade, Ellen Floatman, has urged her client to speak out whenever she can and share her story with the public. We've made her talk to all sorts of media because we think it will help her and it's hard on her, but it's made her stronger. It's made her able to deal with it. Floatman says in the last few years, Stacy has come to recall even more memories of the events leading up to the murder. The more she talks about it, the easier it is for her to deal with it. Every time I hear her tell her story, I hear something new because she's, she's more comfortable every time she tells it. But Lannert doesn't just remember new details from the years she says her father abused her. She now says she also recalls the terrifying event that pushed her past the breaking point. The day of the murder, she claims her father sexually assaulted her sister for the first time. He said, there's your replacement. And he grabbed my sister and he took her in to his room. And I don't know if he raped her. I believed he did. I believed he did. In my mind, he was. She's never said any of this before. Some you can pass off to, well, it's, you know, there's, yes, there's more detail coming out now. But some of the things that she didn't say, you can't pass off to that. Is there anybody who can seriously believe or contend that she wouldn't have mentioned that the night I killed my father